solar refrigeration team recognized that. Um, but I, I'll remind them later. Uh, okay, so we have a, still a few more minutes, I guess, but I'll just get started uh, with general stuff. Um, let's see. So I guess the only announcement here is the instructions for setting up the ray tracing software. So make sure you do this before the class on Tuesday. We reminded you a few times. So, uh, okay, uh, let's see, nothing else new here. Let's just remind ourselves where we are on the schedule, uh, the big picture. So we finish, so let me zoom out a little bit more. So we finished non-imaging optics. Okay, so this is something you should be aware of for the midterm. Uh, today we're gonna talk about radiometry and photometry, which is also important, I would say, uh, for your projects, but also for the midterm. And uh, next week, uh, basically there's the ray tracing software tutorial, very, very important for assignment two and three, so definitely don't miss that. And yeah. next Thursday we have a midterm review. So uh, again, I would, I mean, I'm, I would highly encourage you to come uh, come to it because the midterm, of course, is, uh, is expensive, right? I mean, it contributes to the grade, so. Then October 1st, which is, uh, we'll talk about statistical ray optics, and then October 3rd, we have the assignment two. Okay, so really uh, not, not a lot of time, two weeks. Then we have fall break, and then we have the midterm. So this week, uh, there is no class except we have a TA review, which basically means you can come and ask questions. And generally speaking, the students have a lot of questions from past experience. So make sure you take advantage of it. And, and if you think you don't need uh, that time, then of course we can do a literature, uh, uh, sorry, uh, another lecture. But I, you know, from my past experience, this time is useful. So, but you know, some of you yeah. think that we don't need uh, it. Let you know. Yeah, I see, go ahead. Do you post your old midterms of study? Do you post the old midterms? Yeah, uh, so we have, we, will, we have posted example problems, uh, and those are examples from past midterms. Um, we can probably post more examples. Uh, I'll discuss with up with them. Yeah. But, but there are examples, uh, let's see. So can you show them the link to the? Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm going. To, so it's under geometrical optics for those of you who want to find it, right? It's here. So that, if, you, if you go here, the sample problems are right here. So you see. So the here. idea is in this uh, document, there are the questions right now. So I was thinking maybe you guys can practice and then on the midterm, I can solve them. And after the uh, midterm. Yeah, I, I think the, some of the solutions are also here, by the way. Oh, they were? Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, but, you know, I think it's still. Yeah, I can, I can go through them. Yeah. So they are here. So I would recommend you to review them. Okay, yeah, I forgot. Yeah, everything is here and lots of examples are here. Not, I guess not a lot, but there's plenty, yeah. Uh, we put some links to more and more examples if you want. We can also post more examples. Well, yeah, I, can, I can add more. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, okay, good. Uh, so let's begin. Uh, so today we're gonna to talk about radiometry and photometry. So let's jump to the lectures. It should be here. Oops. Minimize that over here. Okay. So, okay, so before we uh, go into this, let me explain what, are, what do these terms mean? So, so far we have talked about, uh, so first of all, what, what uh, the key, concept of this lecture is how do you measure light, okay? Uh, so far, we have talked about measuring power, which is in watts, intensity in watts per meter squared, uh, of course, energy, which is power times time, and so on and so forth. Here, we are going to um, dig into, essentially, the human aspect of lighting or, or light, which means how does a human being, our eyes, respond to light? And that leads to different um, quantities, okay, which have to be specified. And this is referred to as photometry. Uh, a good example, for instance, is you know how do you design the 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 backlight of your phone, right? Because that is a, a human being is going to interact with it. 
So you want to make it pleasing for the human being or the lighting in an office, for instance, obviously important for the daylighting team, for instance, right? This lecture is quite important from that point of view. Okay, so that's the goal of today's lecture, to understand the quantities and how do you measure them and how, what do you do with these measurements, okay? So let's dig right in. So radiometry refers to the quantities that we typically measure, things like intensity in watts per meter squared, power in watts, wavelength in nanometers, and so on. Photometry includes the human being or the response of the eye. And now we will have different, termino different terminologies which have, ana they're analogous, and I will point out. So intensity has an analogy here, power has an analogy here, and so on and so forth, okay? So let's look at this, one of the simple ideas, which is radiation flux, So, which is basically how much flux is coming out of a lamp, okay? Quite simple. It's simply the quantity of energy that is emitted, transmitted, or received per unit time. Of course, if it's a lamp, it's em we're interested in the quantity of light that's emitted. Um, if it is uh, a window or the windshield of a car or something like that, it is a trans whatever is transmitted. If it's a solar cell, for instance, it's the received. But of course, solar cell is not relevant to human beings, so received would refer to the human eye, for instance, right? So because it's flux, it's energy per unit time. So dQ over dT, where Q is the energy. And of course, the, the units are pretty simple. So this is a radiometric quantity, okay? So the units are radiant power, it's just watts, right? Joules per second. So simple, we all know this. Now, we are going to introduce a human being into the picture, okay? The equivalent quantity of radiant flux is what we call luminous flux, okay? So you see radiant versus luminous, and luminous refers now to perceived power of light by the human eye. And its units are quite different. It's on watts, it's lumens, okay? For example, if you go and try to buy a TV today, they will tell you how many lumens it has, for instance. Um, well, if you, you know, if you look at the technical specs, okay? They won't tell you how many watts it has. I mean, sometimes they do because you wanna talk about energy efficiency, but it's a different issue. Uh, but in terms of perception of the human eye, we refer to luminous flux, which is in units of lumens. And the reason for the, for the distinction between luminous flux and radiant flux is the following. The human eye has different sensitivities at different wavelengths. And this is described approximately by the luminous efficacy function. And we all know this, we cannot see in the UV so good, right? And most of us cannot see very much into the deep red. In fact, as you get older, you, your vision here goes, start going down. So some of you can probably see in, uh, in around some 750 to 800 nanometers, uh, for instance, but I cannot see it, okay? Now, all of us can see very well around 560 nanometers, around green, okay? That is the peak of our vision. So this is spectral sensitivity, or relative sensitivity as a function of wavelength. And the peak is around 560 because that is the peak of the solar radiation. So we, our eyes have basically evolved over millions of years to have the best sensitivity because we are awake during daytime, okay? So our sensitivity of our eye is at the peak of sunlight. So our ancestors could hunt and farm or whatever, right? Of course, there are different animals have different peaks. Dogs have different peaks. Uh, you know, bats obviously have no peak except they do um, acoustic imaging. and deep uh, ocean creatures of different peaks as well. And we'll talk about the color uh, distinguishing factors later on as well. Those are, this is the reason why we have a difference in the radiometric and photometric quantities, the response of the human eye to wavelength, okay? So we will quantify this by something called the luminosity function, okay, which is the, also called the photopic luminous efficiency function, which is basically the response of the eye, this function, okay? Uh, before I confuse you, this, this same function is also called the luminosity function. It is a function of wavelength and it has a weight. Okay, you see this weight. And this is normalized to one, but you can normalize it to different numbers, okay? 
based on what units you want to get to. So here is a normalized version of this equation. It's also called the luminous efficacy uh, function. It's 683 times V of lambda, where V of lambda is this curve, which is normalized to one. Okay, so this curve is V of lambda. And the units now are lumens per watt. Okay, so lumens is the photopic or, uh, or, or the luminous flux, and watts is the radiant flux. So this function allows you to go between the radiant flux and the luminous, uh, luminous flux. So it can go between the measured watts to the human perceived lumens. So if you have a spectrometer and you are measuring watts from a source, you can multiply it by this function here to essentially get lumens. Okay, so keep that in mind. Now, of course, the function of wavelength, so it will be a, it'll be a function, not a number in that case. Of course, if you integrate over all the wavelengths, then you get the total lumens. Uh, just like we saw before, where we had spectral irradiance. So we'll see this uh, analogy later on. So in principle, these functions also depend on light level. So here, we only looked at one function here, but every human being is different. So this is kind of an average over all the human beings that have been you know, experimentally measured. Uh, and also, um, uh, these things are subjective, right? These are psychological so measurements. So it's not like we can actually, not yet anyway, we can actually measure this response in the nerve. Although those experiments, I think, are, have been done more recently. So this is an average, and it changes with light levels as well. So if you have very good, nice lighting conditions under bright sunlight uh, or very nicely lit room, you have something called a photopic response. So you have a response like this. And you can see the efficacy doesn't have to be so high. So it's a little lower, right? You can see it. So photopic refers to vision of eye under well-lit conditions. You can also have something called scotopic and mesopic response. These are under low light conditions. So there's a mesopic response and the scotopic response. And you can see the peak is blue shifted and also the efficiency has to be higher because you don't have as much light coming into your eye. Okay, so there are different cells that respond to this. Uh, you can, we also know that peripheral vision is more sensitive than blue light something uh, you can kind of see so in, in, in these plots so it's just more blue okay so let's try to apply this knowledge to this situation here so we have two examples high pressure sodium lamps illuminating a, a street or you have metal halide lamps illuminating a street which street lighting is better for driving i want you to uh, discuss with your neighbors for let's say 30 seconds or so Okay, so, so someone sh someone shout out an answer and say why. <laughs> Anyone? <laughs> okay, so there's two answers for two options. <laughs> oh, that, no, that, that's good. So let's uh, discuss. So, uh, what is the reason for the sodium lamp? Let's say sodium, high pressure sodium lamps produce a more yellow light, which is less glare on your windshield. So both lamps produce a high level light, so they're both bright, but the high pressure sodium lamps are just easier to handle while driving. Um, okay, I see. Okay. Glare. What What about the metal halide lamps? I'd say metal halide don't produce as much clear <coughs> pressure sodium. So basically the opposite of what you said. So, yeah, wait, it'll produce less clear? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, that's what he said. Okay. 
uh, which might be true, by the way. So my, my intention was not to talk about Claire, which actually could be true. I'm not sure. But my intention was to think about this slide. So first of all, uh, this is low light condition, right? That's when we need the traffic lights, right? uh, street lights, sorry. So under low light conditions, look at the response of our eye is blue shifted, right? We have more response in the blue than in the reds or greens. So my logic would be, and all your answers are correct, so it doesn't really matter, but my logic would be that the metal halide lamps will give us better visibility because they're bluer, right? They're more, they have less red in them than the yellower, redder, uh, high pressure sodium lamps. So that would be my logic. But again, I'm not saying there's one the correct answer there. You know, as long as you have a logic, you can explain it. But that was my intention of asking that question. So think about under low light conditions, our response to the eye has shifted more towards the blue. So, you know, for instance, if you're doing, if you're reading at night, for instance, you might, you know, you might want to have a cooler white versus. There's a question. Yeah, go ahead. I, I'm under the impression that it's opposite of that. And so the sensitivity at low level conditions is more towards blue. That means we would, I, I feel like we would squint more and, and, and it would be, we're more sensitive to it. It's, it's brighter. And so that's why I, the, there's the blue light filters on electronics for, for low light conditions. It filters out. Uh, yes, I, I'm actually not sure where the blue light filter for electronics is uh, is used for. Is that I thought that was had to do with the glare, but I could be wrong. I, I'm not actually sure. Uh, but eyes in low light conditions, it doesn't it doesn't fatigue your eyes as much. It doesn't fatigue your eyes as much. Ah, I see, I see. Yeah, yeah. That that could be. Yeah. It could be. I, I don't know the answer, but my, 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 my intention of showing this slide was basically for you to think about the, the spectral response of the eye under different lighting conditions. Of course, this is not the only factor that you have to take into account when you design these things, but I'm just letting you know this is one of the factors that need to be thought about. But I don't know the, the, the comprehensive response, so, but good point. Well taken. So moving on, I want to talk about a few other uh, quantities that are important here, okay? So first of all, we saw before that our, uh, the function here is dependent on wavelength. So if a source emits more than one wavelength, which is always the case, other, unless you are using a laser, then the strength of the total visual sensation can be calculated by doing it this integral. So this is referred to as a total luminous flux, V of V, which is in lumens, which is 683, which is a constant, comes out of the integral. And this integral goes over all the wavelengths, zero to infinity of the source spectrum. So remember the source has some spectrum multiplied by the human response, V of lambda. Now the source spectrum is in watts per unit wavelength. And then you multiply by V lambda. So the unit wavelength goes away. And then it's just V of lambda, which is unit less, right? Remember it was normalized to one. And this is watts per lumens, and that, uh, sorry, lumens per watt, and the watt cancels out, so the answer is lumens, and units are in lumens. Okay, so just be aware that we have to do this integral for almost any, most sources, natural sources. Now let's think about what a lumen is. Okay, a lumen is the unit of luminous flux, which is a measure of the total amount of visible light emitted by a source, okay, which is what we just did, that integral. This differs from power since luminous flux takes into account the wavelength sensitivity of the human eye. Okay, so first in order to understand this, we have to define some units now. Units are a little bit unfamiliar to us. First, we define what's called a candela, which is the unit of luminous intensity. Okay, intensity as we remember before was watts per meter squared, right? It's per unit area. But here in luminous intensity, candelas are measured not only in unit area, but also in a direction, okay, as you will see shortly. So it's defined as power emitted by a source in a particular direction with the spectral sensitivity of the human eye taken into account. So we'll, we'll see ex exactly what this means. So the, the exact definition of the candela is the luminous intensity in a given direction of a source that emits monochromatic radiation of frequency 540 times 10 to 12 hertz, which approximately is the green, 
and has a radian intensity in that direction of 1 over 683 watts per stir radian. That's not important for us, but remember the 683 comes from that factor, so it just means that when you do the integral, you get one candela. Now, stir radian is something some of you are probably familiar with, but some of you may not be. It's simply the solid angle. In other words, angle measured in three dimensions. And we won't go through the details of how a solid angle is defined. If you're interested, uh, actually I, I have posted a link on the class website. Approximately one candle is the luminous intensity of one candle, which is uh, just historical. So the definitions of units are one lumen is one candela multiplied by one stir radian. Okay. So imagine a simple case where a light source that uniformly radiate one candela in all directions. Okay. So all directions is a big sphere of light, and the solid angle of a full sphere is four pi, four pi stir radians. So if it if the uh, the, the luminous intensity is one candela. So the total flux is one candela, which is per unit angle, solid angle, multiplied by the total solid angle, four pi, will give you four pi, okay? Candela times the radian is lumens. So four pi is about 12.57 lumens. Okay, now let's try to do some examples, okay? And I, and I want you to kind of do it yourself first, and then we'll look through the answers. What is the maximum luminous flux of an LED? whose luminous intensity is one milli candela. I'll let you discuss this. Uh, you can discuss among yourselves for about 30 seconds or so. Go ahead. So the intensity is one milli candela. What is the flux? Remember flux is lumens. And you have to make some assumptions. Think of what an LED is doing. Mm -hmm. So I haven't I have not given you one piece of information that you need, so you have to make an assumption. And that piece of information is into what angle is the light going. I haven't given you the solid angle. So we have an that is the some solid angle. Okay, so let's let's think about how to solve this problem. Uh, and I've given it here. So first Let's imagine the LED is, is emitting into a hemisphere. So, so the LED is usually on a surface, right? So it's emitting into not the full sphere because the bottom is opaque, right? So it's emitting into a hemisphere. So that's my assumption. So the solid angle of a hemisphere is simply half of that of a full sphere. So it's two pi star radians. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the flux is the intensity, which is one milli candela multiplied by the solid angle times two pi. So the answer is two pi times milli candelas times, uh, sorry, so two pi times 10 raised to minus three lumens or ten, two pi milli lumens. Okay. So again, it, it might sound confusing, but it's it's basically just understanding the terminology. So basically you have an, a solid angle over which light is emitted. There's an intensity on the source and you multiply by the intensity, multiply by the solid angle. I'm also making an assumption here that the intensity is uniform across all the solid angle. Right? That's why I can simply do this multiplication. Otherwise I have to do an integral. And in reality, of course, I have to do an integral because it's never completely uniform. So just be aware of that as well. 
Okay, so this uh, some of these terms are confusing, so I would definitely recommend you to uh, uh, review them afterwards. Now we have to move on to the next uh, um, quantity, which is called illuminance, and its units are it's called a lux. Okay, and lux is a very commonly used unit. So, for instance, if you are a designer for displays, let's say uh, LCD display for your laptop. Uh, if you that designer has to specify how much lux is coming from the backlight that is used to design the uh, display, and this is a very very important quantity. And, and, and if you work in this field, you would see this all the time. So let's see what it means. Lux is the SI unit of illuminance or luminous emittance, which is measuring luminous flux. So luminous flux is relevant to the human eye for a unit area. So instead of unit angle here we're talking about unit area that's the difference between lumens and lux okay this is equivalent to intensity in radiometric optics so we'll see that soon so one lux is one lumens per meter square which is one candela to radians per meter square okay remember lumen is candela to radian as we saw in the last example so let's again do some examples so again let, let me summarize the lux is lumens per meter squared. So it's kind of an intensity. Okay. So let's do a few examples to understand this. Again, I want you to do it yourself. So let's read the question first. If we want to achieve an illuminance of 500 lux for a home kitchen, what is the minimum required luminous flux from a single fluorescent light? So imagine you are a lighting designer. Okay. If you are given only one fluorescent light and you need to illuminate uh, a home kitchen with 500 lux as uniformly as possible. So what is the minimum luminous flux from the single fluorescent light? Okay, I'll, I'll let you discuss first before we go into the answers. Okay. Feel free to talk. <laughs> Of course, you do notice that I haven't given you one in, one piece of information as well. So you have to make some assumptions, but I'll let you figure that out first. So the piece of information I haven't given you is what is the area of the home kitchen. So you have to make some assumption about that, obviously. So keep in mind, it's asking for luminous flux, which is in units of lumens, and you are given 500 lux as a requirement. Okay, so let's think about how to answer this question. Uh, as, I, as I said before, uh, the, the key to answering questions like this is to understand what is the question, talking about what are the terminologies. So it's trying to get, you're trying to get 500 lux on a home kitchen, and so we have to make some uh, assumption of the area, right? And that is spread across that area. And the question is, how much intensity do I need, or luminous flux, which is kind of a, um, the power coming from a fluorescent light that I can use to spread over that area, right? And of course, the relationship is simple. The lux is lumens per meter squared. So all I have to do is take the 500 lux equal to some input flux from the source divided by the area I have to assume. So if I take the area that I assume multiplied by the lux, it'll give me how much lumen <laughs> that I need. Okay, pretty simple. So look at it. So the area of the kitchen be 10 meters squared. Okay, reasonable size. So the luminance is luminous flux divided by area, and luminous flux is simply luminance multiplied by area. So 500 lux times 10 meters squared, 5,000 lumens. Good question. Yes, go ahead. Uh, the height of the light source, does it matter? 
it's a, it's a, it's a very good question. It does matter because we know that the light uh, uh, spreads out, right? Remember from the sun, the intensity on the Earth's surface is much higher than the, the surface on Venus, right? Because Venus is much farther away from the sun. So it does matter, but here we're ignoring that effect. So the power, of course, changes as one over r squared, right? Because you're spreading over larger and larger. So it does matter. So you are absolutely correct in assuming uh, we are making another assumption that there is 100% efficiency going from one to the other. And we'll look at an example to actually uh, explain this shortly. So the next part of this question is what we, we want to light a soccer field. So obviously the area of the soccer field is much larger. So this becomes instead of 10 meters squared could become 10,000 meters squared. So this becomes instead of 5,000 lumens, it could be 500,000, 500, no, 5 million lumens. Right? So you can see how the amount of intensity that you need from the source increases with the area over which that you need to illuminate. It's common sense, obviously, but just to get a scale, a sense for the scale. And also to get some realistic numbers, so typically LED puts out 50 to 100 lumens. So just a good um, ballpark number here. Okay. Let's try to understand a few more quantities. Uh, and these are radiometric quantities, so this should be more familiar to us, except the terms are a little bit uh, different. Um, and this is just to, so you understand there are other terms used for the same things. This emittance is, is nothing other than intensity, okay? It's units of watt per meter squared. It can also be called emittance because you can have a source emitting that light, right? This is radiation flux emitted per unit surface area, so watt per meter squared. M is d phi over dA, where phi is the watts or area. dA is the infinitesimal area emitting the radiation. Another name for emittance is the radiance, okay, which is the case where you have a solar cell and light is falling on it, okay, so radiation flux falling on a surface, also watts per meter squared. E is d phi over dA, dA is infinitesimal area receiving the radiation. They're the same thing, okay. <coughs> The corresponding photometric quantity is illuminance and units of flux, which is what we just saw. And intensity is defined as flux per unit solid angle. So this is a little confusing because intensity we typically call watts per meter squared, but in photometric quantities, we don't call it intensity, okay? Uh, it, it, it is uh, watts per steradian. It's called luminous intensity is I, is d phi or d omega, which is watts, per steradian, so the solid angle over which it's spread out. Uh, this is the photometric quantity of luminous intensity with units of candelas, as we saw earlier, lumens per steradian. So this is watts per steradian is intensity per solid angle. Luminous intensity is lumens per steradian. Okay. So of course, does not change, it changes the geometry. So let's see what this means, actually. So if you look at a source here, what this means is that we if you look in a certain direction, the source might be very bright in certain direction and another direction might be very dim, right? For, in, for example, if you look at the backlight of your phone, right, in, if you look straight on, the, the, it's very bright, but if you look at an angle, it starts getting very dim. So that's an example where the radiant intensity changes with the viewing angle. Sometimes we have privacy screens, which actually inc increase that variance. So that's another reason to understand these things. So radiance is ra radiation flux per unit projected area and per unit solid angle. So the way to think about it is imagine you have a surface, a normal to the surface N, light is, uh, and you're looking at it at a direction of theta refer with, regard to, with respect to N, and then we define a small solid angle D omega, around that direction. And L, the radiance, is d phi, which is the flux, divided by dA cos theta d omega. dA cos theta is simply this area dA projected in the direction, so cosine of theta, normal to the direction at which we're looking. 
and that will become more clear as we talk about uh, solar tracking and so on. But obviously, it's it's obvious to you that from the viewing angle of a display that this is important angle. So there is the angle that the normal to the surface makes with the direction of the solid angle d omega. So uh, we can take that definition, and which which can be which originally is radiometric, and then we define photometric quantity, which is luminance. Okay. So here, just to be clear, we define radians, which is a radiometric quantity, okay? Watts per meter squared per star radian. That was the units here. Here, we're going to define luminance, which has candelas per meter squared. Remember, candelas is lumens per star radian. Lumens is kind of like watts, right? So the top is the visual flux divided by area, Ea cos theta times the omega. So radiance luminance can be functions of wavelength, as we know, and then we can define spectral radiance and spectral luminance simply as the integral. So the total luminance is the integral over all the wavelengths of the spectral luminance, uh, spectral radiance. Uh, if you have the V here that refers to a photometric quantity, the V is missing and it's a radiometric quantity. So that's radiance, that's in uh, luminance, and this is per unit wavelength, so that's called spectral luminance. Again, you don't need to memorize any of the stuff, but at least you need to have a conceptual understanding of what these things are. That's what I want you to get out of this. Um, the radiometric quantities can be related to the photometric quantities, uh, as we know, by simply doing this integral, uh, taking the uh, radians, multiplying a spectral radians in this case, right? Depends on wavelength, which is the same as the spectrum of the source multiplying it by the V of lambda, the human eye response, and integrating over all the wavelengths multiplied by 683 gives you luminance. So luminance can be related to spectral radiance. And, and the reason is spectral radiance is something we can measure with a, with a spectrometer, for instance. Whereas this is not something we can measure. It's a, it's a psychological thing, right? It's a human being has to tell you. So that's why we, use, we have to use these standardized uh, curves here. So radiation intensity emitted by an area dA is flux divided by stand, uh, the, the solid angle, d phi or d omega, i dA. And that can also be written as L cos theta dA. So this comes from this equation. So the flux is this multiplied by d phi or d omega is L multiplied by dA cos theta. So IDA, d phi or d omega is L cos theta dA. Now we're going to integrate over all the surface area. So if the radiance is uniform over an area A, the total intensity in a given direction is I of theta is L cos theta integrate over all the dA. Now this L and cos theta, is a, we are going to assume is independent of area that comes out. L is independent of area, which is what this means. Radiance is uniform over an area A. So it comes out of the integral, and then we say out the integral. So I of theta is L of L multiplied by A cos theta. And L could be a dependent on theta as well. So that's why you have L of theta here as well. If the radiance is independent of direction, L of theta is then L, okay, which means it's completely uniform, then I naught is simply L times A. So in other words, ir, in radia radiation intensity or irradiance is simply radiance multiplied by area, which makes sense from radiometric quantities. So simply all it's saying is watts per meter squared times a meter squared gives me watts. Right, so pretty simple. And we'll, we'll see why we're talking about We're talking about this because of something called Lambert's law, which basically says, if I define I naught as L times A, L times A is I naught. My intensity as a function of direction is I naught times cos theta. I equals I naught times cos theta. It's simply saying that if I have a surface or a source and I look straight on, I get the highest intensity. If I look at some angle, I get decreasing intensity and it's decreasing by function of cos theta. And this is referred to as Lambert's law. And another way to think about it, a surface is called Lambertian. So we'll hear about Lambertian surfaces. 
if it emits or receives radiation with an angular intensity pattern that follows Lambert's cosine law, solely dependent on the projected area. So a, a good example is here. So if you think about, let's say, this is a computer graphic simulation, so it's not real. This is, for instance, an inversion surface, where it diffusely reflects, whereas this is what's called a specular reflection. Okay, you can see it nice and shiny. So this is a diffuse, uh, sorry, this is, a, let's say, incident line. And it, the version uh, uh, reflector will diffuse that light in all directions, creating this soft kind of image. So very important in computer graphics. <clears throat> Uh, on the other, so that's a surface. On the other side, uh, an LED or an OLED, for instance, can also be a version. So if you have a, a LED here, uh, to understand how does the light emit in all angles, it follow in an ideal case, it follows this cosine theta law. In other words, you have 100% of the lights going straight through. You will have 90% of the light at some angle, 75%, 50%, and then, and of course, at 90 degrees, it's zero, right? Cosine of 90 goes to zero. So it follows this kind of a circular. If you plot the polar plot or the intensity as a, is proportional to the, uh, the length of this arrow, uh, then you, you'll get a plot which looks like that, simply a circle, okay? That's called a Lambertian emitter. So this is a very simple way to model uh, if you put a bunch of LEDs together. So for instance, in a backlight, you have to use multiple LEDs because you want to get a nice uniform uh, illumination of your display. You, you will calculate based on how um, this variation is, how far apart need the LEDs to, need to be. And that's a very important calculation because that'll tell you how many LEDs do I need to put into a backlight in order to get a very uniform display. And that's a very important number because if you put in too many LEDs, that'll become expensive. If you put in too few, then the display won't look nice. So it's in this design optimization problem. Um, an LED is a very interesting uh, situation. So it's something you should be aware of. You can have many different configurations of an LED, something like a planar LED, so where the active area of the LED is inside the semiconductor. So gallium nitride in the case of blue LED, for instance. And in that case, most of the light is totally internally reflected. Right? Only a small portion of the light actually makes it out into air because this is the higher index material. This refractive index is higher than this, that's air. So most of the light will actually get reflected back. A small portion of the angle comes out. So you have a planar LED can act as a perfect uh, uh, Lambertian pattern. Okay. If you have a hemispherical LED where you can get all the light out, Every, every ray is now normal to the surface. You get a perfect, everything is a, it's perfectly uniform. Okay, everything is, so it follows this hemispherical curve. Everything has units of one. You can also have a parabolic LED where you're basically collimating the light. So this is commonly used for instance for spotlights or flashlights and so on. So you get a curve which looks like that. But the intensity is very high on axis at zero degrees, but at smaller angles, say 20 degrees, you start losing light very fast, right? So it's a, it's a more directional uh, LED. And that's important for certain kinds of displays, for instance, in uh, augmented reality, virtual reality applications, you use uh, displays, um, you, you use very directional LEDs. Okay. Now, I want to spend a little bit of time doing a few examples. And again, I want you to take out a piece of pen and paper and try to work it out yourself first, okay? So let's look at this example. Just, uh, oops, let me zoom out. Uh, point source, okay? So let's imagine a small point source which emits light equally in all directions with radiant power of 10 watts. Oops, sorry. Okay, so it's a point source, like an LED. It is emitting light equally in all directions with radiant power of 10 watts. What is the radiant intensity? Okay, uh, uh, so feel free to discuss with your neighbors, but please do that uh, question, answer that question yourself. And if you're done with that question, 
answer this question. What is its irradiance at a distance r, which by the way is related to the question that uh, I, someone asked earlier, but how far should the source be? How do you take into account the distance of the source in the case of illuminating the kitchen? Right, okay, so we'll, talk, we'll think about that, those two problems. So first, please answer radiant intensity. Uh, you can discuss. Let's spend about 30 seconds. Uh, by the way, we can easily ask questions like this in the midterm. It's uh, relatively straightforward, just conceptual, right? Not a lot of math. So you need to understand what the terminology means. So you can look back at the previous slides. Uh, and I should remind you that the midterm is completely open book, open internet and so on, right? So you don't need to memorize any of the stuff. You can just go back and look at it. To give you a hint, we can go back and see what radiant intensity is. So let's go back. Radiant intensity, radiant intensity, let's find it. Ah, it's here. Radiant intensity is radiation flux per unit area, projected area, and per unit solid angle. What's first radius for me this question? Let's go back to that. So, uh, is everyone confused or are you able to think about it? I, I would be confused. It was the first time I'm seeing this as well. So, so don't worry if you're confused. Just have to think through it. Okay, maybe uh, in a few more seconds and then let's. Yeah, in the interest of time, let's look at the answer. But again, I uh, ask you to think about these problems after the class, okay? Oops. So I tried, I gave you the answer here. So again, we have a point source and it's illuminating, uh, sorry, it's emitting in all directions, right? Four root four pi. So radian intensity is power divided by the total solar angle. Uh, oh, yeah, sorry, I should have showed you the radiant intensity, not the radiance. So I'd given you irradiance when I showed you the slide. That was my mistake. But it's power divided by the total solid angle. So it's 10 watts divided by 4 pi star radians. 10 divided by 4 pi watts per star radian. So that's radiant intensity. It's basically telling you in each direction or each piece of the solid angle, how much power is coming out? Watts per radians. Okay. Now, irradiance is per unit area, which is actually what I showed you on the, on the, um, on the slide. And that's the answer to the second question. What is its irradiance at a distance r? Okay. So, irradiance is power divided by surface area. So, the power is 10 divided by 4 pi r squared watts per minute squared. And here you can see that the irradiance is inversely proportional to R squared. So the farther you go, the more spread out the light is, which of course we know, right? And this is the answer to the previous question about whether it's important how far away you know, the source is when you illuminate the kitchen. And of course it is important. In that particular example, we did not uh, take that into account, okay? But the, the radiometric quantity, you take that into account, is something called 
irradiance. Now, the second question here is something I'm going to leave uh, for you to do as homework, as an example problem, okay? So this is actually a homework for you. Let's first look at the question and I want you to try to answer it later on. So again, we have a spot source. So this is a, a, a flashlight, okay? A radiant power of the bulb is 200 milliwatts. Let me see if I can zoom in. Okay, so that's it's a bulb. It's, let's say a parabolic reflector. It's a flashlight. So it's 200 milliwatts coming out. Okay, it's a three centimeter diameter here. It's expanding to 10 centimeter diameters here at 25 centimeters away. So it gives you all the angles, basically. Uh, this is not important, X centimeter. Okay, let's look at the question. What is the irradiance at a distance 25 centimeters from the flashlight's front window? Okay, 200 milliwatts is coming out. Okay, that's the area there. So that area there, it's asking for irradiance. Irradiance, okay, watts per meter squared. What is its radian intensity, which is this watts per meter squared plus the radian? Okay, we won't do this in class, so I'll leave that as an example for you to do at home. Okay, well, let's move on to the last topic of the lecture, whoops, come out, which is color. So color is, is an interesting topic and it's a very complicated topic because color is very much related to, I mean, there, you can teach the entire books on color and, it's, um, and there are entire courses on color. And the main reason is it's not simply a, a purely scientific thing or something you can purely measure because it's also psychological. So someone um, who sees a, something as red, um, uh, say if I see something as red, you might see it as slightly different because it's, you know your brain might process it differently than mine, right? So color can be psychological, but the goal here uh, because they're engineers, was to standardize the psychology and create some way to describe color in a mathematical term so we can use that to um, essentially uh, design things, right? Like displays or lighting or um, uh, cameras, right? Color cameras, things like that. In order to do that, we have to uh, somehow average the physiological basis among all the you know, humans. And this is the basic physiology, is that we have different four types of cells in our retina, which where the image of the uh, outside world is formed. So we have something called blue cones, which have a response. So this is spectral response, or the retinal response uh, in, in percentage, the function of wavelength. So you have blue cones, which have a high response in the blue, okay? And doesn't respond after about 560, which is the green. So there are cells which do this. And then there are cells which are called green cones, which respond primarily in the green. And then there's some uh, red cones, which respond primarily in the red. And you can see there's some overlap here. There's overlap here as well, okay? But our brain essentially sees the signals from these and is able to reconstruct actual color or what our, we perceive as actual color, okay? uh, The rods are the fourth cell type, which gives you low light it has uh, very little color discrimination, but it gives you low light imaging, and that has a response which looks like that. And this is, of course, related to the response of V of lambda that we talked about before, but in that case, we only talked about rods. We didn't talk about the cones, essentially, because there, they were, there we were talking about simply a monochroma, a, a single intensity response. So the cones give you photopic vision, rods give you scotopic vision, which is again related to the spectral uh, luminance uh, of a human eye that we saw before. Okay, so with that understanding, let's try to understand in, in, um, in, in, in physics, how do we create color? So first of all, uh, we can create color by adding different colors together. So to get white, we can simply add up all the colors of the rainbow. To get pink, we can simply remove some of the colors of rainbow. So this is an example where uh, in the bottom we have a magenta filter, which is basically blocking most of the green. So the bluish and red is coming out and they're mixing to give green. So this addition of these two gives you the green. Okay, 
And this, for instance, what was used in uh, cathode ray TV, TV uh, you know, in a couple of decades ago nowadays, uh, there were electron guns which send in different beams of electrons pass through a mass onto different dyes, which, which emitted red, green, or blue. And by combining the different colors, you can get multiple colors in between those primary colors. Nowadays, of course, we use what's called color subtraction, which happens in an LCD, uh, typically an LCD display. So the way it works is that typically you have white light coming in, okay? And then we have a, a polarizer, okay? By the way, uh, this is a big business in Utah because we have MoxTech. MoxTech, uh, based in Provo, is one of the largest uh, suppliers of these sort of, sorts of polarizers, primarily for projectors, but some also for LCD. So we have a connection there. Uh, so that's the polarizer. Then we have uh, electrodes. These electrodes are used to control the display. Okay, so there are three, as you can see, one for each of the primary colors. Uh, and then there's a liquid crystal material. And when the voltage is applied, that liquid crystal material twists twist the polarization of light. So after here, after this polarizer, light's polarized, but then the light is pulled, uh, the polarization is rotated through the liquid crystal when a voltage is applied. No voltage is applied, nothing happens to it, passes through. And there's another electrode here. So this completes the circuit, right? This electrode and this electrode completes the circuit. And then we have what's called a light filter or a color filter where we have blue here. This means that blue light will pass through. Everything else is absorbed. It's green here means everything. Uh, green will pass through. Everything else is absorbed. Red here means red will pass through. Everything else is absorbed. So in this particular case, and then there's a polarizer on the outside, which will which is rotated 90 degrees to this polarizer, which means that it will block all the light unless the voltage is applied. So in this example, voltage is applied. Polarization of the red is rotated 90 degrees, which allows it to pass through the polarizer. No voltage is applied here. The polarization remains like this, and it's 90 degrees to this polarizer, and nothing will pass through, it's blocked. So now you have a way to control the passage of light for each of the colors independently. So now you can add green, red, blue, whatever, and get all kinds of colors, right? That's the idea. So here, for instance, by combining magenta with orange, you get red and so on. Now, I want to show you one quick video. So first of all, I want you to look at this and I'm going to highlight one problem. One problem is I have come in with 100% white light here and I've come out here with red light, which means in this pixel, although I came in with white, I'm only using red. That means two thirds of the light is simply absorbed here and simply wasted. This is, if you think about the display, the vast majority of the power used by your phone comes from the display because you watch videos, whatever, right? And if the display itself is so inefficient that you're throwing away two thirds of light, this is a problem, okay? And I'll show you one quick video where uh, there's a research project from Panasonic where they're trying to improve the efficiency of the display very quickly. So, and this is an example of an innovation, right? So to give you just a, an example of what happens in a, uh, uh, in a, when you brainstorm. So, let's go. Apatim, can you let me know if you can hear the video? Yeah, I can hear it, but there is some lag. Okay, now it's great. By using micro color splitters instead of conventional color filters in the image settings. Something happened to the audio. Did you stop? Panasonic has developed a unique technology that doubles the brightness of color photography. It's causing uh, problems. It's kind of that. Panasonic has developed a unique technology that doubles the brightness of color photography. 
by using micro color splitters instead of conventional color filters in the image sensor. These two photos were taken using CCDs with the same sensitivity. The one on the right was taken with the color filter system used in nearly all digital cameras, and the one on the left was taken with Panasonic's new micro color splitting system. Until now, image sensors have produced color pictures by using red, green, and blue filters for each pixel. But with that system, 50 to 70% of the light is lost. Uh, something happened again. So in this case, of course, they're yeah, talking about the camera, not a display, but the principle is the same. This photo shows a cross section of the new image sensor. The sensor uses two types of color splitters, red deflectors and blue deflectors. The red and blue deflectors are arranged diagonally. Those are dolphin colors. Uh, the audio is very bad. For example, if white light enters each pixel, pixels where it doesn't pass through the deflector receive unmodified white light. But if you see it with a red deflector, the light is split into red deflected light to the same deflected light. The audio is not good. It's split into blue deflected light and yellow deflected light. As a result, the pixel arrangement is cyan, white plus red, positive, and yellow. The RGB values are then calculated using a processing technique designed specifically for these colors of lights. To design the micro color splitters in this way, it's necessary to analyze optical properties such as reflection, refraction, and diffraction in 3D. Analyzing various wavelengths of light for each form of micro color splitter requires high speed computation, which has been great Can you hear me? Yeah, the audio was really bad. I think we should just post a link on the web page. Yeah, yeah I'll post a link to it. But in any case, um, I, I think that, that the point I wanted to make it come across was here, I wanted you to identify the problem. For instance, the efficiency is very low. And there was an example of someone, you know, in this case, a company that came up with a solution to that problem. So let's just see a simple example. Uh, there are a couple more topics I want to go through before we stop. One is uh, how do you quantify color? So this, for instance, is important for, um, I would say, very important for the daylighting team, for instance, right? Because color perception might be important when you uh, light an office. So you need to understand something called colorimetry, which is how do you quantify the physiological color perception caused by a certain spectral uh, color stimulus? And this is calculated by something called a tri-stimulus theory, where the assumption is that every color can be described by three numbers, which quantify stimulation of the red, green, and blue cones in the human eye. And this is based on a standard, which is uh, referred to as a CIE, which is the French version um, of a standard colorimetric observer, which defines X, Y, Z color matching functions. So, whoops. Which are shown here. So we have a X bar lambda, Z bar lambda, which is the blue here. So this is wavelength. This is a, just a spectral matching function. This is the red, the X bar lambda, and this is Y bar lambda. Now, what you do in order to get the color response value for a given source is very simple. You take the spectrum of the source, which we can, of course, measure, multiplied by each of these functions. 
so in this case x bar lambda, and then do an integral over the entire visible spectrum. So this 380 nanometer, 780 nanometer visible spectrum, and you get a number, xs. Okay, you do the same for ys and zs, and these three numbers essentially give you a number, three numbers that determine what is the perceived color. So you can quantify it. And this is called the tri-stimulus value for a color with a given spectral distribution of a source. Now, of course, this also means that this is not a unique function because the, the spec, you know, different spectra can give you same coordinate numbers as well. And when you look at color plots, they look like this uh, because they're, they're, uh, the, those three quantities are simply averaged into two numbers. So you plot on a two-dimensional plot, which looks like that, in terms of what's called chromaticity and brightness. So in tristimulus, Y is a measure of brightness or luminance, while X and Z are measures of color or chromaticity. So then to simplify this X, Y, Z, you calculate what are called projected coordinates, small x, small y, to define color, okay? So chromaticity is not taken into account, which is, uh, sorry, the brightness is not taken into account. The Y is put aside. So small x is capital X divided by capital X plus capital Y plus capital Z. Um, and small y is capital Y divided by the sum of three. In fact, this is not correct. This should be actually Z and this should be Y. So there's a typo here, which I should fix. So this is this plot, which is plotting X versus Y, okay? A, a curve, a locus, a locus here, for instance. This is called the CI, CIE, which is that standard, color space of chromaticity diagram. So the way to read this is quite simple. So if you, if you pick a point, let's say here, as a value of, you know, let's say 0.3 in X and 0.15 in Y, that has a perceived color of pink. And you can get that value by doing that integral that I showed you before to compute X, Y, and Z, and then compute the X and, this average value is X and Y, and that'll give you that number. The this extent of this color space represents what's called the color gamut, which is a very important quantity in displays. So when you go buy a high-end TV, they talk about increasing the color gamut, which is, for instance, why people like the OLED displays better than conventional LED displays because they have a larger color gamut. In other words, they can represent more colors. So this just means that in this example, in the, for this device, you cannot represent colors outside this, this boundary. Okay, so we, we don't need to spend a lot of time and that's my last slide, so I'll stop here. But uh, let me stop and just mention that um, the, the most important thing for today's lecture is just to understand the different quantities of photometry and how they relate to the corresponding radiometric quantities, lumens, lux, candelas. Those are the most important ones. And they just be able to conceptually understand them and some of the few example problems that we talked about. And of course, there's some conceptual understanding in color as well. So with that, I will stop a few minutes early. And uh, again, if you have time, please meet with your teammates to plan for second assignment. Okay, I'll stop and see if there are any questions before I sign off.